Jack McCorbel, uh, one of the co-founders of Quantum Black and also its chief scientist and uh, partner at McKinsey, um, and joined by Brian Richardson, who's an associate partner, senior data scientist um, uh, at, uh, at Quantum Black, and also leads um, our data-centric AI efforts across Quantum Black and, and McKinsey globally. Just by way of um, explanation, you know, Quantum Black, uh, this will be relevant a little bit in some of the things that I, you know, talk about uh, around around our experience in, in the space. But you know, we're we're a machine learning engineering services company started, you know, quite quite a while ago, uh, back in 2009. Um, you know, uh, myself and two co-founders, uh, we we all had ties to F1 teams, so you know, we're very lucky that. Formula One teams were our anchor clients when we got going um, and started working more with advanced engineering manufacturing firms in the first few years, started working with McKinsey um, in, in that world. So in the first place in semiconductor manufacturing um, and we're ultimately acquired about six and a half years ago now. So at the very end of 2015 and the, the last few years have really been something of a scaling journey. So. Um, you know, a few milestones were, you know, setting up our product engineering arms so of QB Labs um, back in, you know, towards the latter part of 2019. And then after that, in, um, you know, now we're, you know, very much an integrated part of McKinsey's overall analytics and digital practice. But we, you know, have more than 1,000 technical practitioners globally. And so you know, should really think of, you know, us at the level of doing the technical implementation work around designing, developing, and operationally deploying data products and services that, that use ML. Okay. So, I mean, I'll give you a rough guide to, you know, what we'll talk about. So in the first place, um, you know, a very macro and micro view on the importance of, of data, like the macro view will not be surprising. The micro view maybe are things, you know, specifically related to our own experience in, in the space, um, which, I, which I think are, are, are interesting, you know, given some of the scale that we have right now, but also and, and the breadth of settings uh, at the level of functional domains, but also application areas and sectors that we see. Um, you know, we'll talk about some of the things that are really changing um, uh, development and deployment practices um, um, for ML, and specifically, you know, some of the things you know uh, that are emergent really around data centric tooling. And then I've had, you know, Brian is going to walk us through, uh, um, you know, some tooling that we're focused on very specifically related to data quality. And again, this is um, one of uh, a number of, you know, tools and assets that um, are, are meant to really, um, you know, help development teams, engineering teams that are uh, looking to build uh, ML products and really operational ML products. So maybe the macro view to, to, to start with, Th this is, you know, some of this is coming from um, McKinsey quarterly server uh, survey and uh, McKinsey's uh, data transformation practice and the data transformation uh, survey that was that was carried out. And, you know, a lot of the statistics here will not be surprising to, you know, many of you. And this is very much cross a cross sector and, and, a, and a global view, but how much, you know, maybe time and effort and resources ultimately that are expended within enterprises around um, you know around data and maybe relatively uh, low value add data harmonization reconciliation tasks things that are trying to contend with and wrestle with you know poor quality data um, and ultimately you know I think this goes hand in hand at least in our experience with the statistics that you see on the left hand side halfway down around 15 percent of enterprises uh, having ML models in widespread production. Um, one of the big failure points I think is, is really, uh, or one of the big complexities of deploying anything production is really tied to, to, to data. Um, now, in, in the last 12 years, like we've, a lot of how we build and how we do the work that we do has changed quite a few times. I think we've learned quite a few things, but you know, again, this is, very much, um, you know, still uh, very quickly evolving. Um, and giving here a little bit like our own perspective and things that we've surveyed from our own teams globally. And everything that we're seeing here is, um, you know, 
tied to statistics that we ran back in 2019 and 2020. So it's a, it's a couple of years out of date, but I think like the, the, the numbers here um, are, are things that are, you know, I think apply very broadly and you know, aren't just reflective of our own experience, but I think are, are interesting to, to, to bear in mind. So, and I think they give you a view of the importance of data across the entire life cycle. So on the one hand, uh, you've got, you know, a third of projects that are either delayed or abandoned, like think of any number of use cases that are not broached and ultimately don't see, don't come to fruition, um, you know, because of issues tied to data. And of those that start, you still have, you know, you still have a, you know, 78% uh, of those that are go through substantial rescoping. Um, and that includes, you know, deferring part of the implementation. It's, you know, includes halting projects outright, again, tied to data re uh, related issues. And I can say that that is, that is the top reason for uh, post-start rescoping, again, in, in, in our experience. And then after we get into, um, you know, a lot of the engineering complexity and how teams operate during development. And for a lot of, you know, again, we're talking about analytics projects and analytics projects like, you know, maybe it's worth defining as things that involve building models, but they could also be at the level of um, running, um, you know, complex exploratory analysis and even at the level of building complex data pipelines that will abut in, you know, a view of that data that could land in, you know, in, in reporting. So it's not, it's a superset of everything tied to, um, you know, to building model, but of course, things that are tied to building some category of model, whether that's an econometric model, whether that's a machine learning model is, you know, let's say the, the largest share of, of those projects. But still, you know, in, in those projects, you have uh, more than 70% of the engineering development resources that are tied to data engineering activities. So that is a, that is a mix of, um, you know, data, um, data engineering, feature engineering work. It is a mix, uh, you know, and data transformation work writ large. It is um, at the level of, you know, um, you know data quality and, and, and a lot of joining tasks. Um, and, and I think a lot of the things that we're seeing around data, um, you know, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's even a, a, a feature store, which is something that, you know, a specific component within the ML dev lifecycle that's increasingly, you know, well understood and adopted, but that is, um, I think that's really tied to the imperative of that in a lot of enterprise contests is really tied to, you know, this 71% figure and the, the, this thing that, you know, people are really trying to amortize the, the cost of, you know, the high cost of engineering tied to, you know, um, to, to analytics development generally. Um, and then we've got a little bit more than 80% of, of projects that are massively over budget. And again, the top three reasons. So as the top, you know, top reason being data related issues, but among the top three reasons, we have, you know, data quality and, and data transformation complexity. Uh, being to the the top three, and uh, maybe I'll say like again further down the life cycle, we've got you know only eleven percent. You remember like for enterprise wide, it's about fifteen percent of all projects that are in widespread production. Uh, here in in our case, of the projects that we begin, about eleven percent of those are ultimately find their way into production. It's a very low um, you know pass rate, and um, and you know, and of those. Um, you know, 67% of those fail because of issues that are tied to data. And maybe last point for things that, you know, sit in production and again, things that will tie to exception handling and issues that are raised by these models. Uh, you've got almost 90% of those uh, of, of tickets that are, again, are, are tied to data related issues. So all of which is to, you know, re reinforces the importance of um, data centric tooling. Um, and maybe like, this is a point that I'll make extremely quickly, but, you know, we, we are starting to see, um, you know, something of an emergent tech stack, which is very quickly, I think, changing how we think about doing development, you know, uh, ML development and deploying ML models and monitoring them and sustaining them really as, as, as operational capabilities and products. And, you know, this is, 
by no means comprehensive. This is just, uh, you know, some of the um, some of the workflows um, and um, and you know and some of the tools that are that make their way into different parts of the life school uh, the 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 life cycle. And all of this is to say that you know around everything to do with data, and you know some of that might be really the upstream work, but some of that is very much closely coupled to what happens you know, in model development and, you know, in model operations. Um, we, we are starting to see more and more highly specific tooling that are meant to address some of the, the issues. And I think this is just something that is, you know, that is still very much emergent, even at the level of how these things fit together, uh, you know, in and situate themselves in a development workflow in part of the life cycle. I, that that is still something that is in flux and being worked out, but you know what, what Brian's now going to walk us through are things that are specifically tied to you know tooling that can help address data quality pain points. Brian, wonderful. So um, apologies for the uh, the tech issues. Took me a little while to figure out my network, but I think we're in good shape now. Great to be here and to meet everyone. Um, I'm a I'm an associate partner and in, in, in senior data scientist with McKinsey Quantum Black. Um, I focus on building data center tooling for our teams and our clients. So what we're seeing is that data center tools are really having an effect today um, from health, from monitoring, and increasingly fixing data quality for ML purposes. Um, tools like Big Eye, DQ, Holoclean um, are really are really sort of le le leading the charge here. And you know, as we we see the, the shift moving. Like, from data health and data monitoring to like really fixing data on the right side, so changing data to improve ML to improve operations. Um, we're seeing that there's um, that there are are definitely oh I went too far sorry there are definitely um, there are definitely risks. I mean changing data to to, to drive model development or for operational purposes um, can can have can cause harm. Um, whether it be changing product hierarchy data to that can impact people's compensation. Or changing supply chain data that can disrupt, um, you know, you know, shipping shipping lanes, or in, or in one case, um, you know, figuring out like how um, how space stations communicate with with uh, ground station and, and using AI approaches to improve the quality of the data. Um, and increasingly, regulatory guidance is also um, becoming an issue. So this is all to say that data centric AI is very very important. It's it, it's we're seeing it being used more and more to improve and change data. Um, but the risks are real, and governance is is, is critical um, to this process. Um, and this is this is and, and some of the gaps that we're seeing um, with with data centric approaches is that even even if you're able to um, sort of automate um, through probabilistic approaches or through um, machine learning based approaches like HaloClean, um, the improvement of data quality, um, oftentimes those black box ML approaches. Um, you know, just don't work as well because you've got to translate those those changes into explanations for a business user. Um, you know, for for example, one of the um, clients we work with um, had, and we'll go into this case a bit later, had pretty significant problems with their data on their logistics and their supply chain. Um, we needed we needed an approach. We had to be we had to use um, you know ML and data centric approaches to weak supervision to to improve the quality of their data. In a way that was transparent to users, transparent to the business, that could be tested um, by um, you know at, at the warehouses. So this is all to say that the um, transparency is, is is a critical ingredient in the um, in improving the quality and changing data through automated approaches. Um, ML-based approaches that we've seen um, for businesses so, um, are, are very very hard to get across the line. So, okay, so how do you, how do you how do you tackle this? Um, where, where, where do we go next? So, um, can can a data center guy approach help? Um, and the answer is, which I'm sure this group is well aware, the answer is yes, most most definitely. So, um, so we're building a toolkit at, at McKinsey Quantum Black that's designed to do do two three things for clients um, in, in a very very transparent um, data centric approach that shifts the burden from like validating data at, at the back end to incorporating their input at the front end. Um, the first is finding issues. So, auto, so automatically detecting issues um, uh, in, in data sets um, using, that, using contextual based anomaly approaches. Um, the second and, and third, which are probably the most important and newest approaches, are recommending corrections. Um, 
so so we're we're building tools and 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 algorithms and an orchestration layer to be able to um, automate the process of recommending corrections to problems, um, explaining why those corrections were recommended, giving a confidence um, of both the correction and the error, and using that to create a feedback loop for users and experts um, to improve the quality of data um, in a way that um, once that, that that approach is built to fix data, um, we have a pipeline, in this case, most of the time built in PySpark, that can be deployed in enterprise-grade systems like Calibra or SAP FDG or, or, you know, or, 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 or Matic, et cetera. Um, but the idea is that you're able to automate this process of recommending corrections and embedding that because in the past, there, there were no shortage of tools that could find a bunch of issues and, and sort of bury you in problems, um, which wasn't very helpful. Um, and we'll talk through how we tackled that, um, you know, what we're building as well in a few different client situations. So I'm going to jump ahead to the next page. So, so here's, what, here's what we're building um, in Quantum Black. Is a, is, is a modularized toolkit to do this. Um, everything's built in PySpark, um, and there's a, a series of modules that are designed to, to find issues, um, provide diagnostic summaries to clients, explain exactly why the issue is what it is, um, and, and, not, and not just using Lime and Shell, but using counterfactuals, um, what if, why, why not, you know, you know, what if I change this type of analysis. Um, Correction modules that use that, that shift from ML-based approaches like autoencoder and isolation, isolation forest to Bayesian techniques which, which pull the user's input up front in that process. Um, repair modules that are able to plug in seamlessly to <clears throat> enterprise-grade DQ systems and the audit trails that give the governance that you need to make sure that for every single thing that gets changed, um, you've got a record of that. You can walk, you can walk it back, understand why it was changed, who changed it, when it was changed. Um, and through this sort of set of modules and orchestration. Um, we're able to help to, 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 to dramatically accelerate um, a lot of the issues our clients face. Um, now, practically, a lot of these different modules that you, you see here, they, they, they're, they're, they're the right ones, but they themselves aren't distinctive. Um, what really is special about this approach, and you know, where we see this going in the future, is, is, it, 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 is, is its chassis. This, this orchestration layer that provides the ability to connect these different algorithms in ways um, the detect, correct, repair um, are easy to sum up business problems that provide audit level transparency, you know, real level governance, um, and allow non-technical users to engage in the data fixing process. Um, for that, a big part of the, our toolkit um, includes Snorkel and, and other data centric approaches, um, but it is designed for data scientists to use um, and designed for um, you know, real engagement from business users. So next, I'm going to talk to some examples as to how we've sort of deployed this, and and wh why I like these examples is is they're, 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 they're they they show the impact of data cascading across supply chains. They they show how small changes in in a supplier, say, giving uh, you know a, a a distributor bad data, can result in an entire supply chain having 10% excess capacity. So, um, we'll talk about a healthcare case where where a, a, a in, in the midst of the, of the pandemic. Um, they needed to ship more boxes, and they couldn't because they didn't know how big their boxes were. <laughs> we'll talk about a, a one of the biggest phone manufacturers in the world and how they, yeah, how how barcodes, something boring and small, um, were causing them enormous pain um, in back orders. And then we'll talk about our work with the space agency, um, one of the two biggest ones in the world, and how we um, how we use data centric approaches to fix um, and correct data in signals between spacecraft and ground station communications to help engineers figure out what was going on, how to fix it faster. So why don't we start with the, uh, this is this is my favorite my favorite example. I, some of you may have heard me talk about this one before because it, it shows how, how something as, 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 as boring as box weights and dimensions can cause a supply chain to carry 10% excess capacity um, due to data quality errors. In this case, the context is the client is a big, is a big healthcare provider uh, they're distributing a bunch of um, a, a bunch of healthcare supplies and obviously in boxes, and they don't. And this, they're, they're, their um, upstream suppliers weren't providing correct information on how big the boxes were. Um, as a result, they couldn't they couldn't fit their boxes in the containers properly. So they were paying for a twenty percent ocean freight gap, meaning basically air space in containers because they they couldn't properly you know tetris their boxes in these in these, these shipping containers. Um, so we we deployed the toolkit you just saw. Um, 
um, worked with everyone from warehouse workers to um, the CDO to uh, suppliers to automate the correction of their data end to end, um, fixing data for I think 20 or 30,000 products and, and cutting the ocean freight buffer in half to be conservative. Um, but we, we, I mean, their data went from like 65% accurate at best and a three year window to like phone up suppliers and get it fixed to 98% um, accurate, um, you know, validated through measurements and user interaction. So it's, it's, it's a very powerful approach of being, bringing you know, ML based approaches to data. Um, Conscious of time, only five minutes for, for questions. So I'll zoom ahead to the next, next example, which is also uh, uh, quite cool is, um, you know, what are the biggest space agencies in the world? Um, yeah, obviously they've got they've got satellites in space and they've got ground stations and and they're and they're communicating and and whenever a packet drops there's a break in the signal it gets buried in a in a, in a, in a, in a, in a like a basically a log file on some server and it takes the engineers like a few days to figure out you know that it broke where did it break where's the log file how did, who, how did it break and and this is just it doesn't allow you to react fast enough so so we um in collaboration with um with a snorkel the, the the aim was to um to, to see if we can fix that data um, so they can figure out what hap what happened and more proactively um, take it take effect. So we used um, we, we looked at the log files, um, used weeks of revision to label them with the, with the engineering team, um, built an ML model to predict it. And then now they're using this to instantaneously detect um, satellite to ground station communication failures and then detect and then be able to identify the root causes as to what happened. Um, and these are just two examples where I mean this is this is a space that like we see growing rapidly um, because the the the, 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 the just the tools that exist that need need to be built to solve this problem don't yet exist, um, and we're trying to build some of those, but we're excited to work with the community to, to make them better. Um, I think I I think I, I'm at time. I'll just stop there. Maybe maybe Giacomo, we can um, answer some questions that um, the group has. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Akuma and Brian. That was really, really insightful. I think especially the statistics really resonated as well as your image of that tooling and, and, and what tools uh, different companies are using, et cetera. And then information about your internal tool as well. Uh, definitely lots of exciting insights there. Um, so in terms of questions, uh, we'll start taking a couple. So one of the questions that come up was came up was, um, you know, you're talking about your tool finding issues in the data before you even get to the modeling stage. I think you touched on this, but what are some of the techniques you're using for your data validation cleaning process that you can maybe touch on? So, so they're, they're, they're really dependent on the problem we're solving. So in some cases, it's, it's like a, a, a massively paralyzed regex scan. In other cases, um, we use a lot of Bayesian techniques. The Bayesian networks are a big, are, we use a sort of a custom implementation of those. Um, we do a lot of stuff with large language models, um, you know, things of hugging face, internally built ones, um, you know, the usual suspects. Um, as well as the classical anomaly detection techniques. We, we find the most, the, 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 the secret sauce for us in error detection was shifting this approach of, of just finding errors and piling them on users to taking input up front and in, incorporating that knowledge into the model a lot to so Bayesian priors. Got it. Just to follow on to that, so are there certain types of data that you're mostly working with and the tools focused on right now? We use so we we um we, we use most so right now we're focused mostly on tableau data so so think like mm -hmm. transaction data sensor data from um, different in, heavy industry um etc we want we're going to be shifting more and more into video um in the next twelve months but right now we're we're doing a bit a bit with images and a bit with um um so unstructured text and and structured data. Got it. Makes sense. Um, we have some other questions around these finding errors, but I'm going to talk on just another like higher level question, which is around how you uh, approach projects. So I know, I think one of you may have answered it in the chat, but just to highlight it, uh, somebody asked, you know, now that you know that there is a lot of, even once you get to a model, there is some iteration involved in terms of getting to the best model or maintaining the model in the data engineering. So how do you plan projects um, at McKinsey and Quantum Black? Like, do you account for that iteration cycle uh, or, or what does that look like? And how do you explain that to your clients as well? So it, um, I, I, I mentioned that like it's it's so, something of a you know continually evolving process. Like for for you know quite a long time, we've talked about trying to put in place um, you know protocols which um, are really try to um, you know dimensionalize some of the complexity at the level of you know we we ultimately want to navigate um, you know break down a given scope into uh, repeatable activities and, and workflows that are going to be carried out by different technical practitioners. And that's, that's all the way up from, you know, 
um, the work of you know technical and data architects to the work you know maybe even at the level of how we think of configuring and provisioning an environment in which development is going to take place to how the data engineers are going to navigate you know their tasks to how you know data scientists and machine learning engineers are going to do that to how you know DevOps engineers who are supporting teams end to end are, are, are doing a great deal of that. And um, a lot of those activities, the sequence of those activities, and um, you know, a lot of this um, is a function of what the technical scope of the project is. And that isn't just arrived at and worked out, you know, up front. It's something which is sort of discovered and explored, and they're going to have to be pivots throughout the process. Um, but you know, ultimately, as you know, the the and I and I try to answer as much on on the chat as much as we've tried to refine how we scope projects and how we navigate to let's say a tight critical path um, that ultimately abuts in something which is you know in it's not the case everywhere like in some of these you know in some of the work that we're doing all we're trying to get at is you know insights on the back of having let's say mind a given data set right but in mo a lot of what we're talking about here is trying to, you know, build data pipelines that are going to, you know, run, right? We're talking about running code. And um, and as much as we've, I think, tried to template um, a, a lot of our delivery approaches and our implementation approaches, we are still in a world where you run into all the issues that I talked about that whose root cause in some way, you know, though we've got, you know, a pretty broad set of issues ultimately. Um, and we only talked about some cross section. A lot of it is tied to data. And that's like the meta point here. Like we're still, um, a lot of the issues are very granular, you know, even at the level of data engineering, like so much of the implementation effort is still tied to data engineering tasks. Unfortunately, we have to wrap. No, nope, we're at the top of the hour. But thank you so, so much for sharing your insights here uh, and, and, and about the machine learning process as well as the tooling. So thank you very much.